I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, host of the channel Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. By the closing years of the 16th century, the concept of the witch had gone from that of a mere sinner to the heretic par excellence. In the mind of jurists and theologians, the witch had become the chief among the devil's tools to throw the entire Christian world into wickedness just prior to the apocalypse itself. And who better for the devil to target than that godly bastion against antichrist papistry, James VI of Scotland. Judicial torture would uncover a vast international satanic network stretching from Copenhagen to Edinburgh, where covens of witches sent contrary winds and demons against James and his bride. James himself would oversee much of the trials of the 1590s, which brought dozens to tortured confessions, trials, and eventual execution. To popularly counter both the threat of witchcraft and necromancy, but also an intellectual tide turning increasingly towards skepticism of witchcraft, James published his Demonology in 1597. A dialogue in three brief books, the king establishes the reality, nature, activity, and the means by which to detect and punish these satanic shock troops. He further seeks to detail a correct Protestant analysis of the array of diabolical forces, the spirits and devils who take the form of ghosts and fairies with whom witches and necromancers commune. His learned analysis is a compact and most insightful glimpse into the witch beliefs of the time, from the flights to the witch's Sabbath, to the sexual intercourse with demons, to why one would enter into a pact with the devil to begin with. The account of the North Berwick trials and news from Scotland, along with the 1597 demonology of James VI, would go on to cement what scholars now call the elaborated theory of witchcraft, into the insular world, unleashing a series of trials in Scotland that were among the most lethal in all of Europe. If you'd like to learn more about the background of the demonology in the context of the Scottish trials more generally, make sure to check out my episode on the demonology over in Esoterica, intended to be a companion to this piece. But I'm excited to present to you Aton Shea's production of the Demonology of 1597, composed by James the Sixth and First, as read in the original pronunciation. Fearful abounding at this time in this country are these detestable slaves of the devil, the witches or enchanters, hath moved me, beloved reader, to dispatch in post this following treatise of mine, not in any wise as I protest to serve for a show of me learning and engine, but only of the conscience to press thereby so far as I can to resolve the doubt in hearts of many both that such assaults as Satan are most certainly practised, and that the instruments thereof merits most severely to be punished, against the damnable opinions at all principally in our age, whereof the one called Scott, an Englishman, is not ashamed in public print to deny that there can be such a thing as witchcraft, and so maintains the old error of the Sadducees in denying the spirits. The other, called the Virus, a German physician sets out a public apology for all these crafts folks, whereby, procuring their impunity, he plainly betrays himself to be one of their profession. And for to make this treatise the more pleasant and facile, I have put it in the form of a dialogue, which I have divided into three books. The first, speaking of magic in general, and necromancy in special. The second, a sorcery and a witchcraft. And the third, contains a discourse of all these kinds of spirits and spectres that appears and troubles persons, together with the conclusion of the whole work. My intention in this labour is only to prove two things, 
as I have already said, the one that such devilish arts have been and are. The other will exact trial and severe punishment they merit, and therefore reason I what kinds of things are possible to be performed in these arts, and by what natural causes they may be. Not that I touch every particular thing of the devil's power, for that were infinite, but only to speak scholastically, since this cannot be spoken in our language. I reason upon genus, leaving spaces and differentia to be comprehended therein. But one thing I will pray thee to observe in all these places where I have reasoned upon the devil's power, which is the different ends and scopes that God as the first cause and the devil as his instrument and second cause should set in all these actions of the devil as God's hangman. For where the devil's intention in them is ever to perish, either the soul or the body or both of them, that he is so permitted to deal with, God by the contrary, draws ever out of that evil glory to himself, either by the rack of the wicked in his justice, or by the trial of the patient and amendment of the faithful, being wakened up with that rod of correction. Having thus declared unto thee then, my full intention in this treatise, thou wilt easily excuse, I doubt not, as well as my praetor mitten, to declare the whole particular rites and secrets of these unlawful arts, as also their infinite and wonderful practices, as being neither of them pertinent to my purpose, the reason whereof is given in the hinterend of the first chapter of the third book. And who looks to be curious in these things, he may read, if he will hear of their practices, Bodinus's Demonomini, collected with greater diligence than the written with judgment, together with their confessions that have been at this time apprehended. If he would know what hath been the opinion of the ancients concerning their power, he shall see it well described by Hyperius and Hemingius, two later main writers, besides innumerable other neoteric theologues that writes largely upon that subject. And if he would know what are the particular rights and curiosities of these black arts, which is both unnecessary and perilous, he will find it in the fourth book of Cornelius Agrippa and Verus. Oh, my voice back. And so, wishing me pains in this treatise, beloved reader, to be effectual, in arming all them that reads the same against these above mentioned errors, and recommending my good will to thy friendly acceptation, I bid thee heartily farewell. I am surely very glad to have met with you this day, for I am of opinion you can better resolve me as something, whereof I stand in great doubt, nor any other with whom I could have met. In what I can, that you like to spare at me, I will willingly and fairly tell me opinion, and if I prove it not sufficiently, I am heartily content that a better reason carry it away then. What think you these strange nose, which now only furnishes purpose to all men at their meeting? I mean these witches. Surely they are wonderful. And I think clear and plain confessions in that purpose have ne'er fallen out in any age or country. And no question if they be true, but thereof the doctor's doubts. What part of it doubt you of? E'en of all, for aught I can yet perceive, and namely that there is such a thing as witchcraft or witches, and I would pray you to resolve me thereof if you may, for I have reasoned with sundry in that matter, and yet could never be satisfied therein. I shall with good will do the best I can, but I think it the difficulter, since ye deny the thing itself, in general, always for that part, that witchcraft and witches have been and are, the former part is clearly proved by the scriptures, and the last by daily experience and confessions. 
I know you will allege me Sal's Pythoness, but that as appears will not make much for you. Not only that place, but diverse others. But I marvel why that should not make much for me. The reasons are these. First, you may consider that Sal, being troubled in spirit and having fasted long before, as the text testifieth, and being come to a woman that was brooded to have such knowledge, and that to inquire so important news, he, having so guilty a conscience for his anus offences, and specially for that same unlawful curiosity and horrible defection, and then the woman crying out upon the sudden in great admiration for the uncouth sight that she alleged to have seen, discovering him to be the king though disguised, and denied by him before. It was no wonder, I say, that his senses being thus distracted, he could not perceive or feign in ever voice, he being himself in another chalmer, and seeing none. Next, what could be or was raised? The spirit of Samuel, profane and against all theology, the devil in his likeness, as on apparent that either God would permit him to come in the shape of his saints, for then could ne'er the prophets in those days have been sure what spirit spake to them in their visions, or then that he could foretell what was to come thereafter, for prophecy proceedeth only of God, and the devil hath no knowledge of things to come. Yet if you will mark the words of the text, you will find clearly that Saul saw that apparition, forgiven you that Saul was in another chalmer at the making of the circles and conjurations, needful for that purpose, as none of that craft will permit any others to behold at that time. Yet it is evident by the text that our son, that once that unclean spirit was fully risen, she called in upon Saul, for it is said in the text that Saul knew him to be Samuel, which could not have been. By the heron tell only of an old man with a mantle, since there was many more old men dead in Israel nor Samuel, and the common wearer of that old country was mantles. And to the next, that it was not the spirit of Samuel, I grant. In the proven whereof, you need not to insist, since all Christians or whatsoever religion agrees upon that, and none but either mere ignorance, or necromancers, or witches, doubts thereof, and that the devil is permitted at some times to put himself in the likeness of saints, it is plain in the scriptures, where it is said that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Neither could that bring any inconvenience with the visions of the prophets, since it is most certain that God will not permit him to so deceive his own, but only such as first willfully deceive themselves. And as to the devil's foretelling of things to come, it is true that he knows not all things future, but yet that he knows part, the tragical event of this history declares it, which the which a woman could never have forespoken, not that he hath any prescience, which is only proper to God, or yet knows anything looking upon God as an mirror, as the good angels do, he being forever debarred from the favourable presence and countenance of his Creator, but only by one of these two means, either as being worldly wise and taught by in continual experience, ever since the creation, judges by likelihood at things to come, according to the like that hath passed before, and the natural curses in respect to the vicissitude of all things worldly, or else by God's employing of him in a turn, and so foreseen thereof, as appears to have been in this, whereof we find the very like in Micah's prophetic discourse to King Ahab. But to prove this, me first proposition, that there can be such a thing as witchcraft and witches, there are many more places in the scriptures than this, as I said before. As first in the law of God, it is plainly prohibited. But certain it is that the law of God speaks nothing in vain, neither doth it lay curses, or enjoin punishments upon shadows, condemning that to be ill, which is not in essence, or bane as we call it. Secondly, it is plain, where wicked Pharaoh's wise men imitated any number of Moses' miracles, to harden the tyrant's art thereby. Thirdly, said not Samuel to Saul that disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft? To compare to a thing that were not, it, it were too too absurd. Fourthly, was not Simon Magus a man of that craft? And fifthly, what was she that had the spirit of Python? Beside innumerable other places that were too irksome to recite. But I think it very strange that God should permit any mankind, since they bear his own image, to fall in so gross and filthy a defection. Although man, in his creation, was made to the image of the Creator, yet through his fall, having once lost it, it is but restored again in a part by grace only to the elect. 
So are the rest fallen away from God, or given o'er to the hands of the devil, that enemy, to bear his image. And being once so given o'er, the greatest and the grossest impiety is the pleasantest and most delightful unto them. But may it not suffice him to have indirectly the role, and procure the perdition of so many souls by alluring them to voices, and to the following of their own appetites, suppose he abuse not so many simple souls, in making them directly acknowledge him for their master? No, surely, for he uses every man of whom he hath the role, according to their complexion and knowledge. And so whom he finds most simple, he plainly has to discover himself unto them. For he being the enemy a man's salvation, uses all the means again to entrap him so far in his snares, as he may be unable to them thereafter, suppose they would, to rid themselves out to the same. Then this sin is a sin against the only ghost? It is in some, but not in all. All that? Are not all these that runs directly to the devil in one category? There are principally two sorts, whereunto all the parts of that unhappy art are redacted, whereof the one is called magic or necromancy, the other sorcery or witchcraft. What, I pray you? And how many are the means whereby the devil allures persons in any of these snares? In by these three passions that are within ourselves, curiosity and great engines, thirst for revenge, for some torture deeply apprehended, or greedy appetite and gear, caused through great poverty. As to the first of these, curiosity, it is only the enticement of magicians or necromancers, and the other two are the allures of the sorcerers or witches, for that old and crafty serpent, being a spirit, he easily spoils our affections, and so conforms himself thereto, to deceive us to a rack. I would gladly first hear, what thing is it that you call magic, or necromancy? This word magic, in the Persian tongue, imparts as much as to be any contemplator or interpreter of divine and heavenly sciences, which being first used amongst the Chaldees, through their ignorance of the true divinity, was sustained and reputed amongst them as a principle of virtue, and therefore was named unjustly with an honourable style, which name the Greeks imitated, generally imparting all these kinds of unlawful arts. And this word necromancy is a Greek word, compounded in necron and mantea, which is to say, prophecy by the dead. This last name is given to this black and unlawful science by the figure synecdoche, because it is a principal part of that art, to serve themselves with dead carcasses in their divinations. What difference is there betwixt this art and witchcraft? Surely the difference vulgarly put betwixt them is very merry, and in a manner true, for they say that the witches are servants only and slaves to the devil, but the necromancers are his masters and commanders. How can that be true? Yet any men being specially addicted to his service can be his commanders. Yea, that may be, but it is only secundum quid, for it is not by any power that they can have over him, but ex pacto alenerle, whereby he obliges himself in some trifles to them, that he may, on the other part, obtain the fruition of their body and soul, which is the only thing he owns for. On very inequitable contract for serf. But I pray you discourse unto me, what is the effect and secrets of that art? That is or large a fail you give me, ye two shall do good will the most summarily that I can, to run through the principal points thereof. As there are two sorts of folks that may be enticed to this art, to wit, learned or unlearned, so is there two mains, which are the first, stirs up and faders of their curiosity, thereby to make them give themselves o'er to the same, which two mains we call the devil's skull and his rudiments. The learned have their curiosity wakened up and fed by that which we call his skull. This is the astrology judicial. For diverse men have an attained to a great perfection in learning, and yet remain or bear, alas, of the spirit of regeneration and fraud thereof. Finding all natural things common, they assail to vindicate unto them a greater name, by not only knowing the course of things heavenly, but likewise to cling to the knowledge of things to come thereby which at the first face appear in laughable unto them, in respect to the ground thereof seemeth to proceed in natural causes only, they are so allured thereby that, finding their practice to prove true in sundry things, they study to know the cause thereof. And so mounting from degree to degree upon the slippery and uncertain scale of curiosity, they are at last enticed that where laughable arts or sciences fails to satisfy their restless minds, e'en to seek to that black and unlawful science of magic. 
Well, finding at the first that such diverse forms as circles and conjurations rightly joined thereunto will raise such diverse forms and spirits to resolve them of their doubts, and attributing the doing thereof to the power inseparably toyed or inerrant in the circles, and many words of God confusedly wrapped in, they blindly glory in themselves, as if they had by their quickness of engine made a conquest of Plato's dominion, and were become emperors or the Stygian abaticals. Where, in the meantime, miserable wretches, they are becoming very dead, bond slaves to their mortal enemy, and their knowledge for all that they presume thereof is nothing increased except in knowing evil, and the hours of hell for punishment thereof, as Adam's was by the aiding of the forbidden tree. But I pray you likewise, forget not to tell what are the devil's rudiments. His rudiments, so we call first in general, all that which is called vulgarly the virtue of word, arab, and stone, which is used by unlawful charms without natural causes, as likewise all kinds of practices, frets, or other like extraordinary axioms which cannot abide the true touch and natural reason. I would have you make that plainer by some particular examples, for your proposition is very general. I mean either by such kind of charms as commonly daft wives use, for you have never first spoken goods, for preserving them from evil eyes, by knitting round trays or sundriest coins of herbs to the air of the tails of the goods, by curing the worm, by stemming of the blood, by ailing arse crooks, by turning of the riddle, or doing as such like innumerable things, by words, without applying anything made to the part offended as mediciners do. For fro and learned men, being naturally curious and lacking the true knowledge of God, finds these practices to prove true, as sundry of them will do, by the power of the devil for deceiving men, and not by any inerrant virtue in these vain words and frets, and being desirous to win a reputation to himself in such like terms, they either, if they be of the shamefaster sort, seek to be learned by some that are experimented in that art, not known to be evil at the first, or else, being of the grosser sort, runs directly to the devil for embassy or desire again, and plainly contracts with him thereupon. But methinks these means, which are called the school and rudiments of the devil, are things lawful, and have been approved for such in all times and ages, as in special this science of astrology, which is one of the special members of the mathematics. There are two things which the learned have observed from the beginning in the science of the heavenly creators, the planets, stars, and such like. The one is their curse and ordinary motions, which for that cause is called astronomy, which word is a compound of nomos and asteron, that is to say, the law of the stars. And this art indeed is one of the members of the mathematics, and not only lawful, but most necessary and commendable. The other is called astrology being compounded of asteron and logo, which is to say, the word and preaching of the stars, which is divided into two parts, the first by knowing thereby the powers of simples and sicknesses, the course of the seasons and the weather, being ruled by their influence, which part depending upon the former, although it be not of itself a part of mathematics, yet it is not unlawful, being moderately used, supposed not so necessary and commendable as the former. The second part is to trust so much to their influences, as there are boy to foretell what commonwealths shall flourish or decay, what persons shall be fortunate or unfortunate, what side shall win in any battle, what man shall obtain victory at singular combat, what way and of what age men shall die, what horse shall win at match running, and diverse like such other incredible things, wherein Cardinus, Cornelius Agrippa, and diverse others have more curiously than profitably written at large. But yet many of the learned are of the contrary opinion. I grant. You two could give me reasons to fortify and maintain my opinion, if to enter into this disputation it would not draw me quite off the ground of our discourse, besides the misspending of the old day thereupon. One word only we will answer to them, and that in the scriptures, which must be an infallible ground to all true Christians, that in the prophet Jeremiah it is plainly forbidden to believe or hearken unto them that prophecies and forespeaks by the course of the planets and the stars. Well, 
You have said far enough in that argument. But how proof you know that these charms or unnatural practices are unlawful? For so many honest and merry men and women have publicly practiced some of them that I think if you would accuse them all of witchcraft, you would affirm more nor you will be believed in. I say that if you had taken good tint to the nature of that word where Boyan named it, you would not have been in this doubt, nor have mistaken me so far as you have done. For although, as none can be scholars in a school and not be subject to the master thereof, so none can study and put in practice, for study they alone, and knowledge is not more perilous nor offensive, and it is the practice only that makes the greatness of the offence, the circles and art of magic, without committing an horrible defection from God. And yet, as they that reads and learns their rudiments are not the more subject to any schoolmaster, if it plays not their parents to put them in a school thereafter, so they who ignorantly props these practices, which we call the devil's rudiments, unknowing them to be baits, cast out by him for the trappings which his God will permit to fall into his hands. This kind of folks, I say, and no doubt, are to be judged the best of, in respect that they use no invocation, nor help of him, by their knowledge at least, in these turns, and so have never entered themselves in Satan's service. Yet to speak truly for my own part, I speak but for myself, I desire not to make so near writing. For in my opinion our enemy is our crafty, and we are awake, except in the greater grace of God, to assay such hazards wherein he praises to trap us. You have reason for sooth, for as the common proverb saith, they that sup with the devil have need of long spoons. But now I pray you go forward in the describing of this art of magic. For all they become one son to this perfection and evil, in having any knowledge, whether learned or unlearned, of this black art, they then begin to be wary of the raising of their master by conjured circles, being both so difficult and perilous, and so cometh plainly to a contract with him, wherein is specially contained forms and effects. But I pray you, or ere you go further, discourse me somewhat of their circles and conjurations. And what should be the cause of their wearing whereof? For it should seem that form should be less fearful yet than the direct haunting and society with that foul and unclean spirit. I think you take me to be a witch myself, or at the least would fain swear yourself prentice to that craft. Always as I may, I shall shortly satisfy you in the kinds of conjurations which are contained in such books, which I call the Devil's Skull. There are four principal parts, the persons of the conjurers, the axion of the conjuration, the words and rites he has to that effect, and the spirits that are conjured. You must first remember to lay the ground that we told you before, which is that it is no poor inerrant in the circles, or in the holiness of the names of God blasphemously used, nor in whatsoever rites or ceremonies at that time used, that either can raise any infernal spirit, or yet limit him perforce within or without these circles. For it is he only, the father of all lois, who having first prescribed that form of doing, feigning himself to be commanded and restrained thereby, will be loath to pass the bounds of these injunctions as well thereby to make them glory in the empiring over him, as I've said before, as likewise to make himself so to be trusted in these little things, that he may have the better commodity thereafter, to deceive him in the end, with a trick once for all, I mean the everlasting perdition of their soul and body. Then, lay in this ground, as I have said, these conjurations must have few or more in number of the persons, conjurers, always passing the singular number, according to the quality of the circle and the form of apparition. To all principal things cannot well in this errand be wanted. Ole water, whereby the devil mocks the papists, and some present of a living thing unto him. There are likewise certain seasons, days, and hours that they observe in this purpose. These things being already and prepared, circles are made triangular, quadrangular, round, double, or single, according to the form of apparition that they crave. But to speak of the diverse forms of the circles, of the innumerable characters and crosses that are within and without, and out through all the same, of the diverse forms of apparitions that the crafty spirit eludes them with, or all such particulars in that axion, I remit it to the or many that have busied their heads in describing of the same, as being but curious, and altogether unprofitable. And this far only we touch, that when the conjured spirit appears, which will not be a while after many circumstances, long prayers and much muttering and murmuring of the conjurers, like a papist priest, dispatching an unton mass, how soon, I say, he appears, if they have missed one or he ought of their rights, or if any of their fate once slid o'er the circle through terror of his fearful apparition, he pays himself at that time, in his own hand, of that due debt which they own, and otherwise would have delayed longer to have paid him. I mean, he carries them with him, body and soul.
Indeed, there is cause enough, but rather to leave him at all than to run more plainly to him if they were wise he dealt with. But go forwards now, I pray you, to these turns, for all they become once dagons in this craft. The effect of their contract consists in two things, in farms and effects, as I began to tell already, where it were you not interrupted me. By farms I mean in what shape or fashion he shall come unto them when they call upon him, and by effects so I understand in what special sorts of services he binds himself to be subject unto them. The quality of these farms and effects is less or greater according to the skill and art of the magician. For as to the farms, to some of the baser sort of them, he obliges himself to appear at their calling upon him by such a proper name which he shows unto them, either in likeness of a dog, a cat, an ape, or such like other best, or else to answer by a voice only. The effects are to answer to such demands as concerns curing the diseases, their own particular menagerie, or such other best things as they require of him. But to the most curious sort, in the forms he will oblige himself to enter into a dead body, and there out of to give such answers of the event of battles, of matters concerning the estate of commonwealths, and such like other great questions. Yea, to some he will be a continual attender, in form of a page. He will permit himself to be conjured, for the space of so many years, either in a tablet or a ring or such like thing, which they may easily carry about with them. He gives them power to sell such wares to others, whereof some will be dearer and some better cheap, according to the lion or true speaking of the spirit that is conjured therein. So are the effects correspondent unto the same, for he will oblige himself to teach him arts and sciences, which he may easily do, being so learned a knave as he is, to carry them nose from any part of the world, which the agility of a spirit may easily perform, to reveal to them the secrets of any person, so being they be once spoken, for the thought none knows but God. Yea, he will make his scholars to creep in credit with princes, by foretelling them many great things, part true, part false, for if it were all false, he would lose credit at all ends, but always doubt some, as his oracles were. And he will also make them to play as princes, by fair banquets and dainty dishes, carried in short space, for the farthest part of the world. For no man doubts but he is a thief, and his agility, as we spake before, makes him to come such spade. Such like, he will guard his scholars with fair armies of horsemen and footmen in appearance, castles and forts, which are all but impressions in the air, easily gathered by a spirit, drawn so near to that substance himself. And yet are all these things but a deluding of the senses, and in no way is true in substance, as were the false miracles wrought by King Pharaoh's magicians, for counterfeiting Moses. For that is the difference betwixt God's miracles and the devil's. God is a creator. What he makes appear a miracle, it is so in effect. As Moses' rod, being cast down, was no doubt turned into a natural serpent, whereas the devil, as God's ape, counterfeiting that by his magicians, made their ones to appear so only to men's outward senses, as coithed in effect by their being devoured by the other. For it is no wonder that the devil may delaud our senses, since we say by common prof that simple jugglers will make an hundred things seem both to our eyes and ears otherwise than they are. No, as to the magician's part of the contract, it is in a word that thing which we said before that the devil wants for in all men. Surely you have made this art to appear very monstrous and detestable. But what I pray ye shall be said to such as maintains this art to be lawful, for as evil as you have made it. We say they savour of the pan themselves, or at least little better, and yet we would be glad to hear their reasons. There are two, principally, that e'er I heard used, beside that which is founded upon the common proverb, that the necromancers command the devil, which ye have already refuted. The one is grounded upon a received custom, the other upon an authority, which some thinks infallible. Upon custom, we see that diverse Christian princes and magistrates, severe punishers of witches, will not only or see magicians to live within their dominions, but e'en sometimes delight to see improve some of their practices. The other reason is that Moses being brought up, as it is expressly said in the scriptures, in all the sciences of the Egyptians, were of no doubt this was one of the principles. And e'en notwithstanding this art plays in God as he did, consequently that art professed by so godly a man could not be unlawful. As to the first year reasons, grounded upon custom, 
I say an evil custom can ne'er be accepted for a good law, for the o'er great ignorance of the word in some princes and magistrates, and the contempt thereof in others, moves them to sin evilly against their office in that point. As to the other reason, which seems to be a greater weight, if it were formed in a syllogism, to speak in terms of logic, for first, that that general proposition, affirming Moses to be taught in all the sciences of the Egyptians, should conclude that he was taught in magic, I see no necessity. For we must understand that the spirit of God there, spake in the sciences, understands them that are lawful. For except they be lawful, they are but abusively called sciences, and are but ignorances indeed. Nam homo pictus, non est homo. Secondly, given that he had been taught in it, there is a great difference betwixt knowledge and practising of a thing, as I said before. For God knoweth all things, being always good, and of our sin and our infirmity proceedeth our ignorance. Thirdly, given that he had both studied and practised the same, which is more nor monstrous to be believed by any Christian, yet we know well enough that before that ever the Spirit of God began to call Moses, he was fled out of Egypt, being forty years of age, for the slaughter of an Egyptian, and in his good father Jethro's land, first called at the fiery bush, having remained there other forty years in exile. So that suppose he had been the wickedest man in the world before, he then became a changed and regenerate man, and very little of old Moses remained in him. Abraham was no idolater in Ur of the Chaldees before he was called, and Paul, being called Saul, was a most sharp prosecutor of the saints of God, while that name was changed. What punishment then think ye merits these magicians and necromancers? The like no doubt that sorcerers and witches merits, and rather so much greater, as their error precedes the greater knowledge, and so draws nearer to the sin against the Ole Ghost. So say I the like of all such as consults, inquires, entertains, and oracies them, which is saying by the miserable ends of many that asks counsel of them. For the devil hath never better tidings to tell to any than he told to Sal. Neither is it lawful to use so unlawful instruments, were it ne'er for so good a purpose. For that axiom in theology is most certain and infallible, numquam faciendum est malum ut bonum inde euniat. Now, since you have satisfied me now so fully concerning magic or necromancy, I will pray you to do the like in sorcery or witchcraft. That failed is likewise very large, and although in the mouths and pins are many, yet few know the truth thereof, so well as they believe themselves, as I shall so shortly as I can make you, God willing, as easily to perceive. But I pray you, before you go further, let me interrupt you here with a short digression, which is that many can scarcely believe that there is such a thing as witchcraft, whose reasons I will shortly allege unto you, that you may satisfy me as well in that, as you have done in the rest. For first, whereas in the scripture it seems to prove witchcraft to be, by diverse examples, and specially by sundry of the same, which ye have alleged, it is thought by some that this place speaks of magicians and necromancers only, and not of witches. As in special these wise men of Pharaohs that counterfeited Moses' miracles, were magicians, say they, and not witches, as likewise that Pythoness that Sal consulted with, and so was Simon Magus in the New Testament, as that very style impors. Secondly, where you would upon the daily practice, and confession of so many, that is thought likewise to be but very melancholic imaginations, or simple raven creatures. Thirdly, if witches had such poor a witching of folks to death as they say they have, there had been none left alive long since in the world but they. At the least, no good or godly person of whatsoever estate could have escaped their devilry. Your three reasons, as we take, are grounded the first of them negative upon the scripture, the second affirmative upon physic, and the third upon the certain prof of experience. As to your first, it is most true and dead that all these wise men of Pharaoh were magicians of that art, as likewise it appears well that the Poythoness, with whom Sal consulted, was of that same profession, and so was Simon Magus. But you omit to speak of the law of God, wherein are all magicians, divines, enchanters, sorcerers, witches, and whatsoever of that kind that consults with 
with the devil plainly prohibited, and alike threatened against. As to your second reason, grounded upon physic in attributing their confessions or apprehensions to a natural melancholic humour, any that places physically to consider upon the natural humour of melancholy, according to all the physicians that ever writ thereupon, they shall find that that will be an o'er short cloak to cover their knavery with. For as the humour of melancholy in the self is black, heavy, and terrain, so are the symptoms thereof in any persons that are subject thereunto, blainness, paleness, desirous solitude, and if they come to the highest degree thereof, mere folly and mania, whereas by the contrary, a great number of them that have ever been convict or confessors of witchcraft, as may be presently seen by many that have at this time confessed, they are by the contrary, I say, some of them rich and worthy boys, some of them fat or corpulent in their bodies, and most part of them altogether given o'er to the pleasures of the flesh, continual aunt in a company, and all kinds of merriness, both lawful and unlawful, which are things directly contrary to the symptoms of melancholy, whereof I spake. And further experience daily proves how loath they are to confess without torture, which witnesseth their guiltiness, whereby the contrary the melancholics ne'er spare to betray themselves by their continual discourses, fading thereby their humour in that which they think no crime. As to your third reason, it scarcely merits an answer. For if the devil their master were not bridled, as the scriptures teacheth us, suppose there were no men nor women to be his instruments, he could find ways enough, without any help of others, to rack all mankind, whereunto he employs his old study, and goeth about like a roaring lion, as Peter saith to that effect. But the limits of his power were set down before the foundations of the world were laid, which he hath not power in the least jot to transgress. But beside all this, there is our greatest certainty to prove that they are, by the daily experience of the arms that they do, both to men and whatsoever thing men possess, whom God will permit them to be the instruments, so to trouble or visit, as in my discourse of that art, you shall hear clearly proved. Come on then, I pray you, and return where you left. This word of sorcery is a Latin word, which is taken from casting of the lat, as therefore he that uses it is called sortorius a sorte. As to the word of witchcraft, it is nothing but a proper name given in our language. The cause wherefore they were called sortarii proceeded of their practices seeming to come a lot or chance, such as the turning of the riddle, the knowing of the form of prayers, or such like tokens, if a person diseased would live or die. And in general, that name was given them for the using of such charms and freights as that craft teacheth them. Many points of their craft and practices are common betwixt the magicians and them, for they serve both one master, although in diverse fashions. And as I divided the necromancer into two sorts, learned and unlearned, so must I divide them in other two, rich and of better account, poor and of baser degree. These two degrees now of persons that practices this craft answers to the passions in them, which, I told you before, the devil uses as a means to entice them to his service. For such of them that are in great misery and poverty, he allures them to follow him by promising unto them great riches and worldly commodity. Such as though rich, yet burns in a desperate desire of revenge. He allures them by promises to get their turn satisfied to their art's contentment. It is to be noted now that the old and crafty enemy of ours assails none, though touched with any of these two extremities, except he first find an entrance ready for him, either by the great ignorance of the person he deals with, joined with an evil life, or else by their carelessness and contempt of God, and finding them in an utter despair for one of these two former causes that I have spoken of, he prepares the way by fading them craftily in their humour, and filling them further and further with despair, while he find the time proper to discover himself unto them. At which time, either upon their walk in solitary of the fields, or else lying panzing in their bed, but always without the company of any other, he, either by a voice or in likeness of a man, inquires of them what troubles them, and he promiseth them a sudden and certain way of remedy, upon condition on the other part, that they follow his advice and do such things as he will require of them. At which time, before he proceeds any farther with them, he first persuades them to addict themselves to his service, which being easily obtained, he then discovers what he is unto them, makes them to renounce their God and baptism directly, and gives them his mark 
upon some sacred place of their body, which remains so unhealed, while his next maiden with him, and thereafter ever insensible, however it be nipped or pricked by any, as his daily proved, to give him a prof thereby, that as in that doing he could hurt or ail them, so all their ill and well doing thereafter must depend on him. You have said now enough for their initiating in that order. It rests then that you discourse upon their practices, for all they be past apprentices, for I would fain hear what is possible for them to perform in very dead. In two parts their axioms may be divided, the axioms of their own persons, and the axioms proceeding from them towards any other. And this division being well understood will easily resolve you what is possible for them to do. For although all that they confess is no lie upon their part, yet doubtlessly in my opinion a part of it is not indeed according as they take it to be. And in this we mean the axioms of their own persons. For as I said before, speaking of magic that the devil eludes the senses of these scholars of his in many things, so say I the like of these witches. Then I pray you first to speak of that part of their own persons, and sin you may come next to their axioms toward others. To the effect that they may perform such services of their false master as he employs them in, the devil, as God saith, counterfeits his servants this service and form of adoration that God prescribed and made his servants to practice. For as the servants of God publicly uses to convey for the servant of them, so makes he them in great numbers to convey, though publicly they dare not, for his service. As none conveys in the adoration and worship in a God, except they be marked with his scale, the sacrament of baptism, so none serve of Satan, and conveyance to the adoring of him, that are not marked with that mark, whereof we are a despair. As the minister sent by God, teacheth plainly at the time of their public conventions, out as serve him in spirit and truth, so that unclean spirit, in his own person, teacheth his disciples at the time of their convening, out to work all kinds of mischief, and craves compt of all their horrible and detestable proceedings past, for advancement of his service. Yea, that he may the more vively counterfeit and scorn God, he oft time makes his slaves to convey in these very places, which are destined and ordained for the conveying of the servants of God, I mean by churches. But this far, which I have yet said, I not only take it to be true in their opinions, but e'en so to be indeed. For the farm that he used in counterfeiting God amongst the Gentiles makes me so to think. As God spake by his oracles, spake ye not so by his? As God add as well bloody sacrifices as others without blood, add he not the like? As God add churches sanctified to his service with altars, priests, sacrifices, ceremonies, and prayers, add he not the like polluted to his service? As God gave responses by Urim and Thummim, gave he not his responses by the entrails of beasts, by the singing of fowls, and by their axioms in the air? As God, by visions, dreams, and ecstasies, revealed what was to come, and what was his will unto his servants, used day not the like means to forewarn his slaves of things to come? This reason then moves me, that as he is that same devil, and as crafty now as he was then, so will he not spare appearance in these axioms that I have spoken of, concerning the witch's persons. But further, a witch is oft times confessed not only his conveying in the charge with him, but his occupying of the pulpit. Yea, their form of adoration to be the kissing of his inner parts, which, though it seem ridiculous, yet may it likewise be true, seeing as we read that in Calicut, he, appearing in the form of a goat book, hath publicly that unhonest damage done unto him by every one of the people. So ambitious is he, and grady of honour, which procured his fall, that he will e'en imitate God in that part, where it is said that Moses could say but the inner parts of God for the brightness of his glory. And yet that speech is but anthropopoeia. But by what way, say they, or think yet possible, that they can come to these unlawful conventions? There is the thing which I esteem their senses to be deluded in, and though they lie not in the confessing of it, because they think it to be true, yet not to be so in substance or effect. 
For they say that by diverse means they may convey, either to the adoring of their master, or to the putting in practice any service of his, committed unto their charge. What way is natural, which is natural riding, going out or sailing, at whatever their master comes and advertises them, and this way may be easily believed. Another way is somewhat more strange, and yet it is possible to be true, which is by being carried away by the force of the spirit, which is their conductor, either above the earth or above the sea, swiftly to the place where they are to mate, which I am persuaded to be likewise possible, in respect that as Habakkuk was carried by the angel in that form to the den where Daniel lay. For if the devil may form what kind of impressions he places in the air, as I have said before, speaking of magic, why may not far easily er, thicken and obscure so the air that is next about them, by contracting it straight together, that the beams of any other man's eyes cannot pierce through the same to say them? But the third way they are coming to their conventions is that wherein I think them deluded. For some of them saith that, being transformed in the weakness of a little base or fool, they will come and pierce through whatsoever house or church, the while ordinary passages be closed, by whatsoever open that the air may enter in at. And some saith that their bodies, lying still as in an ecstasy, their spirits will be ravished out of their bodies, and carried to such places. And for verifying whereof, will give evident tokens, as well as by witnesses that have seen their body lying senseless in the meantime, as by naming persons whom with they met, and given tokens what purpose was amongst them, whom otherwise they could not anon. For this form of journeying they affirm to use most, when they are transported from one country to another. Surely I long to hear your own opinion of this, for they are like old wives' trattles about the fire. For them that are transformed in likeness of beasts or fowls can enter through so narrow passages, although I may easily believe that the devil could, by his workmanship upon the air, make them appear to be in such forms, either to themselves or to others. Yet if we can contract solid body within so little room, I think it is directly contrary to itself. For to be made so little and yet not diminished, to be so strong straightly drawn together and yet feel no pain, I think it is so contrary to the quality of a natural body, and so like to the little transubstantiate god in the papist's mass that I could ne'er believe it. Forsooth, your opinion in this seems to carry most reason with it. And since ye have ended then the axioms belonging properly to their own persons, say forward now to their axioms used toward others. In their axioms used toward others, three things ought to be considered. First, the manner of their consulting thereupon, next their part as instruments, and last their master's part, who puts in the same in execution. As to their consultations thereupon, they use them oftest in the churches, where they convene for a dorm. At what time their master, inquiring at them what they would be at, every one of them propones unto him what wicked turn they would have done, either for obtaining riches, or for avenging them upon any whom they have malice at, who, granting their demand, as no doubt willingly I will, since it is to do evil, he teacheth them the means, whereby they may do the same. As for little trifling turns that women have a doeth, he causeth them to disjoint dead corpses, and to make polders thereof, mixing such other things there amongst as he gives unto them. But before you go further, permit me, I pray, to interrupt you one word, which you have put me in memory of by speaking of women. What can be the cause that there are twenty women given to that craft, where there is but one man? The reason is easy. For as that sex is frailer than man is, so it is easier to be entrapped in these gross snares of the devil, as was or well proved to be true by the serpents to save and evade at the beginning, which makes him the homelier with that sex sensing. Return now where you left. To some others, at these times, it teacheth how to make pictures of wax or clay, that by the rasting thereof, the persons that they bear the name of may be continually melted or dried away by continual sickness. To some, he gives such stones and polders as will help cure or cast on diseases. And to some, he teacheth coins of uncouth poisons, which mediciners understands not, for he is far cunninger than man in the knowledge of all the occult properties in nature. They can lay the sickness of one upon another, which like 
likewise is very possible unto him. For since by God's permission he laid sickness upon Job, we may not far easier lay one upon another. For as an old practician he knows well enough what humour dominions most in any of us, and as a spirit he can subtly waken up the same, making it peccant or to abound as he thinks most for trouble in us, when God will so permit him. And for the taking off of it, no doubt he will be glad to relieve such a present pain, as he may think by these means to persuade to be catched in his everlasting snares and fetters. They can raise storms and tempests in the air, either upon sea or land, though not universally, but in such a particular place and prescribed bounds as God will permit them to so trouble. They can make folks to become frantic or manic, which likewise is very possible for their master to do, since they are but natural sicknesses, and so he may lay on these coins as well as any others. They can make spirits either to follow and trouble persons, or aunt certain noses, and affray oftentimes the inhabitants, as hath been known to be done by your witches at this time. And likewise they can make some to be possessed with spirits, and so to become very demoniacs. And this last sort is very possible, likewise, to the devil their master to do, since he may easily send his own angels to trouble in what form he places, any whom God will permit him to so use. But will God permit these wicked instruments by the power of the devil their master to trouble by any of these means any that believes in him? No doubt. For there are three kinds of folks whom God will permit so to be tempted or troubled. The wicked, for their horrible sins, to punish them in the like measure. The godly, that are sleeping in any great sins or infirmities and wakeness of faith, to waken a month of faster by such an uncouth form. And in some of the best, that their patience may be tried before the world, as Job's was. For why may not God use any kind of extraordinary punishment when it pleases him, as well as the ordinary rods of sickness or other adversities? Who then may be free from these devilish practices? No man not to presume so far as to promise any impunity for himself. For God hath before all beginnings preordained as well the particular sorts of plagues as of benefits for every man, which in the own time he ordains them to be visited with. And yet ought we not be all the more afraid for that of anything that the devil and his wicked instruments can so do against us? For we daily fight against the devil in a hundred other ways, and therefore as a valiant captain, a phrase no more being at the combat nor strays from his purpose for the machine shot of a cannon, nor the small clack of a pistol. Suppose he be not certain what may light upon him. E'en so, ought we boldly go forward in fighting against the devil, without any greater terror for those his rarest weapons, nor for the ordinary whereof we have daily the prof. Is it not lawful then by the help of some other witch to cure the disease that is cast on by that craft? No way is lawful, for I gave you the reason thereof in that axiom of theology, which was the last words I spake on magic. Oh then, may these diseases be lawfully cured. Only by earnest prayer to God, by amendment of their lives, and by sharp pursuing every one, according to his calling, are these instruments of Satan, whose punishment to the death will be a salutary sacrifice for the patient. And this is not only the lawful way, but likewise the most sure. For by the devil's means can ne'er the devil be cast out, as Christ saith. And when such a cure is used, it may well serve for a short time, but at the last it will doubtlessly tend to the utter perdition of the patient, both in body and soul. But who dare take upon him to punish them, if no man can be sure to be free from their unnatural invasions? We ought not the more of that to restrain from virtue, that that way whereby we climb thereunto be straight and perilous. But besides that, as there is no coins of persons so subject to receive harm of them as these that are infirm and wake faith, which is the best buckler against such invasions, so have they so small poor or none, as or such as zealously and earnestly pursues them, without sparing for any worldly respect. But what is their power against the magistrate? Less or greater, according as he deals with them. For if he be slothful toward him, God is very able to make him instruments to waken and punish his sloth. But if he be the contrary, he, according to the just law of God and allowable law of all nations, will be diligent in examining and punishing of him. God will not permit their master to trouble or hinder so good a work. But for all they be once in ends and for man's, have they any further power in their craft? 
that is according to the form of their detention. If they be but apprehended and detained by any private person, or upon other private respects, their power no due to either in escaping or in doing art is no less nor ever it was before. But if on the other part, their apprehending and detention be by the lawful magistrate upon the just respects of their guiltiness in that craft, their power is then no greater than before that e'er they meddled with their master. For where God begins justly to strike by his lawful lieutenants, it is not in the devil's power to defraud or bereave him of the office or effect of his powerful and revenging scepter. But will ne'er their master come to visit him, for all they be once apprehended and put in ferments? That is according to the estate that these miserable wretches are in. For if they be obstinate and still deny him, he will not spare when he finds time to speak with him, either if to find him in any comfort, to fill him more and more with a vain hope of some manner of relief, or else he find him in a deep despair, by all means to augment the same, and to persuade him by some extraordinary means to put themselves down, which very commonly they do. But if they be penitent and confess, God will not permit him to trouble him any more with his presence and allurements. It is not good use in his counsel, I see then. But I would earnestly know, when he appears to them in prison, what forms uses he then to take? To those capped creators he appears as he pleases, and as he finds matters for their humours. For even at their public conventions, he appears to diverse of them in diverse forms, as we have found by the difference of their confessions in that point. For he deluding them with vain impressions in the air, makes himself to seem more terrible to the grosser sort, that they may thereby be moved to fear and reverence in the more, and less monstrous and Coth like again to the craftier sort, lest otherwise they might stir and scunner at his ugliness. How oh, can he then be felt as they confess they have done him, if his body be but of air? We hear little of that amongst their confessions. Yet maybe he make himself palpable either by assuming any dead body and yaws in the ministry thereof, or else by deluding as well their sense of failing, as saying which is not impossible for them to do, since all our senses, as we are so weak, and even by ordinary sicknesses, will be oftentimes deluded. But I would spare one word further yet concerning his appearance to them in prison, which is this. May any other that chances to be present at that time in that prison see him as well as they? Sometimes they will, and sometimes not, as it pleases God. Hath the devil then power to appear to any other, except to such as are his sworn disciples? Especially since all oracles and such like kinds of illusions were taken away and abolished by the coming of Christ. Yet that these abusing spirits say it is not sensing that sometimes to appear, daily experience teaches us. Indeed, this difference is to be marked betwixt the forms of Satan's conversing visibly in the world. For are two different forms thereof, the one of them by the spreading of the evangel and conquest of the wheat arse, in the sixth chapter of the Revelation, is much endured and become rarer therethrough. This is apparent to any Christians, troubling of them outwardly, or possessing of them constrainedly. The other of them is become commoner and more used sensing, I mean by their unlawful arts, whereupon our all business hath been. This we find by experience in this oil to be true. For as we know, more ghosts and spirits were seen nor tongue can tell in the time of blind papistry in these countries, where now, by the contrary, a man shall scarcely all his time hear once of such things. And yet, were these unlawful arts far rarer at that time? And ne'er were so much heard of, nor so rife as they are now. What should be the cause of that? The diverse nature of our sins procures at the justice of God diverse sorts of punishments answering thereunto. And therefore, as in the time of papistry, or fathers erring grossly and through ignorance, that midst of errors overshadowed the devil to walk all the more familiarly amongst them. And as it were by bernly and affraying terrors to mock and accuse their bernly errors. By the contrary, we are now being sound of religion, and in our life rebelling to our profession. God justly, by that sinner rebellion, as Samuel calleth it, accuseth our life so willfully fighting against our profession. Since you are entered now to speak of the appearing of spirits, I will be glad to hear your opinion in that matter, for many denies that any such spirits can appear in these days, as I have said. 
Doubtlessly, who denoyeth the power of the devil, would likewise deny the power of God if they could for shame. For since the devil is the very contrary opposite to God, there can be no better way to know God than by the contrary, as by the one's power, though but a creator, to admire the power of the great creator, by the falsehood of the one to consider the truth of the other, by the injustice of the one to consider the justice of the other, and by the cruelty of the one to consider the mercifulness of the other, and so forth in all the rest of the essence of God and the qualities of the devil. But I fear indeed there be o'er many Sadducees in this world that denies all kinds of spirit. For a convicting of whose error there is cause enough, if there were no more, that God should permit it sometimes spirits visibly to coithe. I pray you now then go forward and tell in what you think fabulous, or may be true in that case. That coin that the devil is conversing in the earth may be divided in far different coins, whereby ye frayeth and troubleth the bodies of men. For the abusing of the soul I have spoken already. The first is where spirits trouble some houses or solitary places. The second, where spirits follow upon certain persons, and at diverse hours troubles them. The third, when they enter within them and possess them. The fourth is these kind of spirits that are called vulgarly the fairy. Other three farmer coins yard already how they may artificially be made by witchcraft to trouble folk. No, it rests to speak of their natural common, as it were, and not raised by witchcraft. But generally I must forewarn you one thing before I enter into this purpose, that is, that although in me discoursing of them I divide them into diverse coins, you must not withstand in thereof not me phrase of speaking in that, for doubtlessly they are in effect but all one kind of spirits, who, for abusing the more mankind, takes on these sundry shapes, and uses diverse forms of outward axioms, as if some were of better nature than other. Now we return to me purpose. As to the first coins of these spirits, that were called by the ancients by diverse names, according as their axioms were. For if they were spirits that haunted some houses, by appearing in diverse and horrible forms, and making great din, they were called lemures, or spectra. If they appeared in likeness of any defunct to his friends of his, they were called umbrae mortuorum, and so innumerable stylus they got, according to their axioms, as we have said already. The cause why they aren't solitary places, it is by reason that they may affray and wrangle the more the faith of such as them alone on such places. For our nature is such, as in companies we are not so soon moved to any such kind of fear, as being solitary, which the devil, knowing well enough, he will not therefore assail us but when we are wake. And besides that, God will not permit him so to dishonour the societies and companies of Christians, as in public times and places to walk visibly amongst them. On the other part, when he troubles certain houses that are dwelt in, it is a short token either of gross ignorance, or of some gross and slanderous sins amongst the inhabitants thereof, which God by that extraordinary rod punishes. But by what way or passage can these spirits enter in these houses, seeing they allege that they will enter door and window being staked? They will choose the passage for their interests according to the form that they are in at the time. For if they have assumed a dead body, wherein to they lodge themselves, they can easily enough open without din any door or window, and enter in thereat. And if they enter as a spirit only, any place where the air may come in at is large enough an entry for them. And will God then permit these wicked spirits to trouble the rest of a dead body before the resurrection thereof? Or if he will do so, I think it should be of the reprobate only. What more is the rest troubled of a dead body when the devil carries it out to the grave to serve his turn for a space, nor when the witches takes it up and disjoints it, or when a swine warts up the graves? The rest of them that the scripture speaks of is not meant by a local remaining continually in one place, but by their resting from their travels and miseries of this world, while their latter conjunction again with the soul at that time to receive full glory in both. 
and that the devil may use as well the ministry of the bodies of the faithful in these cases, as of the unfaithful, there is no inconvenience. For his haunting with their bodies after they are dead can no ways defoil them in respect of the soul's absence, and for any dishonour it can be unto them, but by what reason can it be greater than the hanging, edding, or many such shameful deaths that good men will suffer? For there is nothing in the bodies of the faithful more worthy of honour, or freer from corruption by nature, nor in those of the unfaithful. While time they be purged and glorified in the latter day, as is daily seen by the vile diseases and corruptions that the bodies of the faithful are subject unto, as you will say clearly proved when I speak of the possessed and demoniacs. But where are these spirits' haunts and troubles any houses, what is the best way to banish them? By two means may only the remedy of such things be procured. The one is ardent prayer to God, both of these persons that are troubled with them, and of that church whereof they are. The other is the purging of themselves by amendment to life from such sins as have procured that extraordinary plague. And what means then these coins of spirits, when they appear in the shadow of a person newly dead, or to do to his friends? When they appear upon that occasion, they are called wraiths in our language. Amongst the Gentiles, the devil used that much to make them believe that it was some good spirit that appeared to them then, either to forewarn them of the death of their friend, or else to discover unto them the will of the defunct, or what was the way of his slaughter, as is written in the book of the histories prodigious. And this way he easily has saved the Gentiles, because they knew not God. And to that same effect is it that he now appears in that manner to some ignorant Christians. For he dare not so elude any that knoweth that neither the spirit of the defunct can return to his friend, or yet an angel use such forms. And are not our werewolves one sorts of these spirits also, that ants and trouble some houses or dwell in places? <laughs> there hath indeed been an old opinion of such like things. For by the Greeks they were called lycanthropoi, which signifieth man-wolves. But to tell you simply my opinion in this, if any such like thing hath been, I take it to have proceeded but of a natural superabundance of melancholy, which, as we read, that it hath made some think to themselves pitchers, and some horses, and some one kind of beast or other. So suppose I that it hath so viciated the imagination and memory of some, as per Lucidia Intervalla, it hath so oily occupied them that they have thought themselves very wolves indeed at these times, and so counterfeited their axion and going on their hands in fate, pressing to devour women in bairns, fighting and snatching with all the town dogs, and in using such like other brutus axions, and so to become based by a strong apprehension, as Nebuchadnezzar was seven years. But as to their having and oiding of their and Shelley Slaws, I take that to be but act by uncertain report, the author of all lies. Come forward now to the rest of these coins of spirits. As to the next two coins, that is, either those that outwardly troubles and follows some persons, or else inwardly possesses them, I will conjoin them into one, because as well the causes are alike in the persons that they are permitted to trouble, as also the ways whereby they may be remedied and cured. What kind of persons are they that yours is to be so troubled? Two coins in special, either such as being guilty of grievous offences, God punishes by that horrible kind of scourge, or else being persons of the best nature per adventure that you shall find in all the country about them, God permits them to be troubled in that sort for the trial of their patience and wakening up of their zeal, for admonishing of the beholders not to trust or much in themselves since they are made of no better stuff, and per adventure blotted with no smaller sins, as Christ said, speaking of them upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, and for giving likewise to the spectators matter to praise God, that they merit to no better are yet spared from being corrected in that fearful form. There are good reasons for the part of God, which apparently moves him so to permit the devil to trouble such persons. But since the devil hath ever a contrary respect in all the axioms that God employs him in, which is, I pray, the end and mark he shoots at in this turn? It is to obtain one or two things thereby, if he may. The one is the tinsel of their life. By endorsing them to such perilous places at such time as he either follows or possesses them, which may procure the same, and such like, so far as God will permit him, by tormenting them to waken their body and cast them in incurable diseases. The other thing that he places to obtain by the troubling of them is the tinsel of their soul, by enticing them to mistrust and blaspheme God. 
either for the intolerableness of their torments, as he is said to have done with Job, or else for his promising unto them to leave the troubling of them, in case they would so do, as is known by experience at this time by the confession of a young one that was so troubled. Since you have spoken now of both of these kinds of spirits, comprehending them in one, I must now go back again and spit in some questions to every one of these kinds in special. And first, for these that follow certain persons, you know that there are two sorts of them. One sort that troubles and torments the persons that they aren't with, another sort that are serviceable unto them in all kinds of their necessaries, and omits ne'er to forewarn them of any sudden peril that they are to be in. And so in this case, I would understand whether both these sorts be but wicked and damned spirits, or if that last sort be rather angels, as should appear by their axioms, sent by God to assist such he specially favours. For it is written in the scriptures that God sends legions of angels to guard and watch o'er his elect. I know well enough wherefore that error which you allege hath proceeded, for it was the ignorant Gentiles that were the fountain thereof. Who for that they knew not God, they forged in their own imaginations, every man to be still accompanied with two spirits, whereof they called the one Janius Bonus, the other Janius Malus, the Greeks called them Eudaemona and Cacodaemona, whereof the former, they said, persuaded him to do all the good he did, the other enticed him to do all the evil. But praised be God that we that are Christians, and walk not amongst the Sumerian conjectures of man, know well enough that it is the good spirit of God only, who is the fountain of all goodness, that persuades us to the thinking or doing of any good. And yet the devil, for confirming in the heads of ignorant Christians that error first maintained amongst the Gentiles, he whiles among the first kinds of spirits that I speak of, appeared in times of papistry and blindness, and haunted diverse houses without doing any evil, but doing, as it were, necessary turns up and down the house. And this spirit they called Bruni in our language, who appeared like a rough man, Yea, some were so blinded as to believe that their house was all the sons here, as they called it, that such spirits resorted there. But since the devil's intentions in all his axions is evil, what evil was there in that form of doing, since their axions outwardly were good? Was it not evil enough to deceive simple ignorance, in making them to take him for an angel of light, and so to account a god's enemy as of their particular friend? Where, by the contrary, are we that are Christians ought assuredly to know that since the coming of Christ in the flesh and establishing of his church by the apostles, all miracles, visions, prophecies, and appearances of angels or good spirits are ceased, which served only for the first sowing of faith and planting of the church, where now the church being established, and the white horse were of voice back before having made his conquest, the law and prophets are thought sufficient to serve us, or make us inexcusable, as Christ saith in his parable of Lazarus and the rich man. The next question that I would spare is likewise concerning this first of these two kinds of spirits that you have conjoined, and it is this. You know how it is commonly written and reported that amongst the rest of these sorts of spirit that follow certain persons there is one more monstrous nor all the rest? In respect, as it is alleged, they converse naturally with them whom they have trouble and haunts with? And therefore, I would know in two things your opinion here, in first, if such a thing can be, and next, if it be, whether there be a difference of sexes amongst these spirits or not. That abominable coin that the devil is abusing of men or women was called of old incuboy and succuboy, according to the difference of the sexes that they conversed with. By two means, this great kind of abuse might possibly be performed. The one, when the devil only has a spirit, and stealing out the sperm of a dead body, abuses him that way, they not greatly see in any shape or feel in anything but that which he so conveys in that part, as we read of a monastery of nuns, which were burnt for their being that way abused. The other means is when he borrows a dead body, and so visibly, and as it seems unto them, naturally, as a man converses with him. But it is to be noted that in whatsoever way he useth it, that sperm seems intolerably cold to the person abused. For if he steal out the nature of a quick person, it cannot be so quickly carried, but it will both twine the strength and eat by the way, which it could never have had for lack of agitation, which in the time of procreation is the procurer and wakener up of these two natural qualities. 
And whereas you inquire if these spirits be devoid into sexes or not, I think the rules of philosophy may easily resolve a man of the contrary, for it is a sure principle of that art, that nothing can be devoid in sexes except such living bodies as much have a natural seed to generate by. But we know spirits hath no seed proper to themselves, nor yet can they gender one with another. How oh, is it then that they say sundry monsters have been gotten by that way? These tales are nothing but Aniles fabuloi, for that they have no nature of their own I have showed you already, and that the cold nature of a dead body can work nothing in generation, it is more nor plain as being already dead of itself, as well as the rest of the body is. And in case such a thing were possible, which were all utterly against all the rules of nature, it would breed no monster, but only such a natural offspring as would have come betwixt that man or woman and that other abused person in case they both, being alive, had had ado with other. For the devil's part therein is but the naked carrying or expelling of that substance, and so it could not participate with no quality of the same. Indeed, it is possible to the craft of the devil to make a woman's belly to swell after he hath that way abused her, which he may do, either by stirring up her own humour, or by herbs, as we see beggars daily do, and when the time of her delivery should come, to make her foil great dollars, like unto that nature of course, and then subtly to slip into the midwife's hands, stocks, stones, or some monstrous bairn brought from some other place. But this is more reported and guessed at by others, nor believed by me. But what is the cause that this kind of abuse is thought to be most common in such wild parts of the world as Lapland and Finland, or in our North Isles, or Orkney and Shetland? Because where the devil finds greatest ignorance and barbarity, there assails he grossliest, as I gave you the reason wherefore there was more witches of womankind than men. Can any be so unhappy as to give their will and consent to the devil's vile abusing them in this form? Some of the witches have confessed that he hath persuaded them to give their will and consent thereunto, that he may thereby have him feltered the sickerer in his snares. But as the other compelled sort is to be pitied and prayed for, so is this most oily to be punished and detested. Well, we have told you now all me doubts, and you have satisfied me therein concerning the first of these two coins of spirits that you have conjoined. Now, I am to inquire only two things that you are concerning the last coin, I mean the demoniacs. The first is, whereby shall these possessed folks be discerned from them that are troubled with a natural frenzy or mania? The next is, how can it be that they can be remedied by the papists' church, whom we count as heretics? It should appear that one devil should not cast out another, for then would his kingdom be devoided in itself, as Christ said. As to your first question, there are diverse symptoms, whereby that heavy trouble may be discerned from a natural sickness, and specially three, omitting the diverse vain signs that the papist attributes unto it, such as the raging at holy water, their flaying aback from the cross, their not abiding the air in a god named, and innumerable such like vain things that were like fascius and feckless to recite. But to come to these three symptoms then whereof I spake, we account the one of them to be the incredible strength of the possessed creator, which will far exceed the strength of six of the whitest and wardest of any other men that are not so troubled. The next is the boldening up so far of the patient's breast and belly, with such an unnatural stirring and vehement agitation within him, and such an iron hardness of his sinews so stiffly bended out that it were not possible to prick out, as it were, the skin of any other person so far. So mightily works the devil in all the members and senses of his body, he being locally within the same, suppose of his soul and affectations thereof, he have no more power than any other man's. The last is the spaking of sundry languages, which the patient is known by them that were acquainted with him never to have learned, and that with an uncouth and hollow voice, and all the time of his spaking, a greater motion being in his breast than in his mouth. And as to your next demand, it is first to be doubted if the papists, or any not professing the only true religion, can relieve any of that trouble, and next, in case they can, upon what respects it is possible unto them. As to the other part of the argument, in case they can, which rather, with reverence of the learned, think and otherwise, I am inclined to believe, by reason of the faithful report that men sound of religion have made according to their sight thereof. 
I think if so be, I say these may be the respects, Christ gave a commission and power to his apostles to cast out devils, which they, according thereunto, put in execution. The rules he bade them observe in that axion was fasting and prayer, and the axion itself to be done in his name. This power of theirs proceeded not then of any virtue in them, but only in him who directed them, as was clearly proved by Judas having as great power in that commission as any of the rest. It is no wonder, then, these respects of this axiom being considered, that it may be possible to the papists, though erring in sundry points of religion, to accomplish this, if they use the right form prescribed by Christ herein. Surely it is no little wonder that God should permit the bodies of any of the faithful to be so dishonoured as to be a dwelling place for that unclean spirit. There is it which I told right now, would prove and strengthen me argument of the devil's entering into the dead bodies of the faithful. For if he is permitted to enter into their living bodies, e'en when they are joined with the soul, how much more will God permit him to enter into their dead carrions, which is no more man, but the filthy and corruptible case of man. For as Christ saith, it is not anything that enters within man that defies him, but only that which proceeds and cometh out of him. Now we pray you come unto that fourth kind of spirits. That fourth kind of spirits, which by the Gentiles was called Diana, and her wandering court, and amongst us was called the Fairy, as I told you, or our good neighbours, was one of the sorts of Elusians that was rifest in the time of papistry. For although it was held odious to prophesy by the devil, yet whom these kinds of spirits carried away and informed, they were thought to be sonsiest and of best life. To speak of the many vain trattles founded upon that Elusian, O oh, there was a king and a queen of the fairies, of such a jolly court and train as they had. O oh, they had attained, and doughty as it were, of all goods. How oh, they naturally rode and went, ate and drank, and did all other axioms like natural men and women. I think it like her Virgil's can't be a lazy, nor anything that ought be believed by Christians. Except in general, that as I spake sundry times before, the devil eluded the senses of sundry simple creators, in making them believe that they saw and heard such things as were nothing so indeed. But how can it be then that sundry witches have gone to death with that confession, that they have been transported with the fairies to such an ill, which opening they went in and there saw fairy queen, who being no loiter, gave them a stone that had sundry virtues, which at sundry times hath been produced in judgment? I say that, even as I said before, the imaginary ravishing of the spirit forth from the body. For may not the devil object to their fantasy? Their senses being dulled, and as it were asleep, such ills and oozes within them, such glycerin cords and trains, and whatsoever such like wherewith he placeth to delude them. And in the meantime, their bodies being senseless, to convey in their hand any stone or such like thing which he makes them to imagine to have received in such a place. But what say you to their foretelling the death of sundry persons, whom they allege to have seen in these places? That is, a soth dream, as they say, since they see it waking. I think that either they have not been sharply enough examined, that gave so blunt a reason for their prophecy, or otherwise I think it likewise is possible that the devil may prophesy to them when he deceives their imaginations in that sort, as well as when he plainly speaks unto them at other times for their prophesying, is but by a kind of vision, as it were, wherein he commonly counterfeits God amongst the ethnics, as I told you before. I would know now whether these coins of spirits may only appear to witches, or if they may also appear to any other. They may do to both, to the innocent sort, or either to a frame, or to seem to be a better sort of folks nor unclean spirits are, and to the witches to be a colour of safety for them, that ignorant magistrates may not punish them for it, as I told even now. But I have heard many more strange tales of this fairy, nor you have yet told me. As will I do in that, as I did in all the rest of me discourse. For because the ground of this conference of ours proceeded of your spearing at me at our meeting, if there was such a thing as witches or spirits, and if they had any power, I therefore have framed me all discourse only to prove that such things are and may be, by such number of examples as I shall to be possible by reason, and keeps me from dipping any further into playing the part of a dictionary to tell whatever I have read or heard in that purpose, which both would exceed faith, and rather would seem to teach such unlawful arts, nor to disallow and condemn them, as is the duty of all true Christians to do.
Then to make an end of our conference, since I say it draws late, what form of punishment think you merits these magicians and witches? For I say that you account them all alike to be guilty. They ought to be put to death. According to the law of God, the civil and imperial law, and the municipal law of all Christian nations. But what kind of death, I pray you? It is commonly used by fire, but that is an indifferent thing to be used in every country, according to the law or custom thereof. But ought no sex, age, nor rank be exempted? None at all, being so used by the lawful magistrate, for it is the highest point of idolatry, wherein no exception is admitted by the law of God. Then bairns may not be spared? Yea, not an air the less I may conclusion, for they are not that capable of reason as to practice such things. And for any being in company and not reviling thereof, their less and ignorant age will no doubt excuse them. I see you condemn them all that are the counsel of such crafts. No doubt. For as I said, speaking of magic, the consulters, trusters in, or seers, entertainers, or stirrers up of these crafts folks are equally guilty with themselves that are the practicers. Whether may the prince then, or supreme magistrate, spare or, or say any that are guilty of that craft, upon some great respects known to him? The prince or magistrate, for further trials cause, may continue the punishment of him such a certain space as he thinks convenient. But in the end, to spare the life, and not to strike when God bids strike, and so severely punish, and so odious of fault and treason against God, it is not only unlawful, but doubtless no less sin in that magistrate, nor was it in Saul's sparing of Agag, and so comparable to the sin of witchcraft itself, as Samuel alleged at that time. Surely then, we think since this crime ought to be so severely punished, judges ought to be where to condemn any but such as they are sure are guilty. Neither should the clattering report of a carling serve in so weighty a case. Judges ought indeed to be aware whom they condemn. For it is as great a crime, as Solomon saith, to condemn the innocent as to let the guilty escape free. Neither ought the report of any one infamous person be admitted for a sufficient proof, which can stand a no law. And besides that, there are two other good helps that may be used for their trial. The one is the finding of their mark, and the trying of the insensibleness thereof. The other is their floating on the water, for as though on a secret murder, if the dead carcass be at any time thereafter handled by the murderer, it will gush out of blood, as if the blood were crying out to heaven for revenge of the murderer, God having appointed that sacred supernatural sign for trial of that sacred unnatural crime. So it appears that God hath appointed, for a supernatural sign of the monstrous impiety of the witches, that the water shall refuse to receive him in her bosom, that have shaken off the sacred water of baptism, and willfully refuse the benefit thereof. No, not so much as their eyes are able to shed tears, threaten and torture him as he plays, while first they repent, God not permitting them to dissemble their obstinacy in so horrible a crime, albeit the womenkind especially be able otherwise to shed tears at every light occasion when they will, yea, although it were dissemblingly like the crocodiles. Well, we have made this conference to last as long as leisure would permit. And so to conclude then, since I am to take my leave of you, I pray God to purge this country of these devilish practices, for they ne'er were so rife in these parts, as they are now. We pray God that so be too. But the causes are our manifest that makes them to be so rife. For the great wickedness of the people on the one part procures this horrible defection, whereby God justly punisheth sin by a greater iniquity. And on the other part, the consummation of the world, and our deliverance draw near, makes Satan to rage the more in his instruments, knowing his kingdom to be so near an end. And so, farewell for this time. Adapting demonology into essentially a feature-length film adaptation was a fascinating challenge. I first read the text in 2018 or 19 uh, when I was doing research for my fiction film, The Sudbury Devil, and I've reread it in whole or in part several times since then, mainly pulling quotes for Witchfinder General videos. I don't think that there's a better resource for 
really kind of understanding the mind of the 17th century witch hunters, at least Protestant ones. I was initially drawn to make this, uh, quite frankly, because of demonology's structural similarities to Checkmate Lincolnites. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of figured, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at speaking in uh, original pronunciation, and I have sort of experience editing this kind of video of like sort of the dialogue, educational dialogue. So I figured, you know, if, if, if anybody was going to make this thing, it was probably going to be me. Probably the thing that challenged me the most was the language, which honestly surprised me because, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relatively conversant in, in early modern English and I've done, you know, Shakespeare on uh, stage and stuff, you know, that's from this period, the 1590s. So I thought, yeah, you know, I'll be fine. It, it won't be that, that big of a deal, you know, but, um, what I've been reading a lot recently, you know, and the world, the sort of period that I tend to live in the most is the late 17th century. And it's really quite striking just in those, just, just those two, three generations, just how much the language changed, you know, the diction, the word order, the grammar, the vocabulary. Uh, so that was really interesting to kind of experience. I also didn't realize quite how much James slips into Scots in this book. Uh, the whole time when I was transcribing the dialogue and modernizing the spelling, I, I perpetually had a uh, database of dictionaries of the Scots language open in a tab on my computer. And uh, so really kind of that was an unexpected education. And I really enjoyed getting to know that language a little bit. And speaking of language, I, I really wanted the dialogue to be the star of the show here. You know, I didn't want to go in for really flashy visuals um, or, or crazy costumes. I took a lot of inspiration from old school, low budget BBC adaptations of Shakespeare, uh, the one starring Derek Jacoby or Patrick Stewart or whatever, where the sets were very minimal if there were sets at all. And there was never really any attempt to make it seem as though they were shooting anywhere but a soundstage. You know, it, it was very cheap, but in a way that that worked because there was nothing to distract you from the poetry of the language. And it was all about the performances. It was all about the words. So so I did a similar thing, just, you know, set up a big black void in uh, in my, my front room, which was there for four days, uh, which my significant other was not happy about. But and to make it as uh, accessible as possible to modern viewers, I wanted the whole thing to have a very conversational, natural feel to it as much as I possibly could. Uh, you know, James isn't the, you know, he's not going to win any awards for his naturalistic dialogue. So I wanted to sort of counteract that by making it feel very informal, you know, two guys in shirt sleeves sitting around a table, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and especially with Epistemon, who has 70% of the lines in this, you know, there's a temptation when playing that kind of character to make him like a hard ass, to make a stoic kind of, you know, uh, imposing witch hunter guy. And, but a couple things, you know, regarding that, I mean, one, I just didn't want to do the witch finder general, you know, just like play that character in a different costume, you know, cause that would just be, that would just get old real fast. And, uh, and two, you know, that's just not really the story that the text was telling. The book is a treatise, right? It's a work of scholarship. Um, and the way that James just sort of mansplaining to us like we're total idiots reminds me nothing so much as as uh, somebody with a master's degree and and 10,000 Twitter followers, you know, uh, <laughs> just a, a real kind of know-it-all. And, and I wanted to very much kind of bring that energy to it. In that vein, I'm guessing that a lot of you were surprised by how logical James's arguments were. Uh, I mean, logical with a capital L, right? Uh, he, he isn't driven by superstition. You know, in fact, he sees himself as directly opposed to it. Instead, he's acting on the presumptions that are based on the theological and scientific consensus of the Protestant world at that time. Likewise, the Puritan witch hunters who inherited a lot of James's ideas were learned men, exceptionally well-educated, who saw themselves as bulwarks of rationality in a world dominated by quasi-pagan superstitions, or freights, as James calls them. But the existence of these spells and entities ran contrary to Protestant theology. The witch hunters had no reason to doubt the veracity of this folklore, so they came up with alternate explanations for it. 
so the fairies in the woods were not benevolent sprites. They were demons who wrought false miracles to deceive Christians into abandoning their faith. The sheer pervasiveness of stories of the supernatural convinced witch hunters that the devil was undergoing a full-scale assault on Christendom uh, in, as James says, this kind of Odinic quest to gather as many souls as possible for his final battle with God at the end of the world. Looked at it in this way, it makes sense that the Puritans and the witch hunters would do everything in their power to discover this evil and to root it out. We may not like demonology's conclusions, and we might scoff at its magical thinking, but still, in James's Protestant rationalism, we can, dare I say, faintly hear a whisper of the Enlightenment, right, of the scientific method. But let's not miss the forest for the trees here. This book helped orchestrate the murders of hundreds of people in England and America, thousands in Scotland. It directly inspired Richard Bernard to write A Guide to Grand Jurymen, which is the definitive Puritan witch hunting manual. And uh, Matthew Hopkins, in his pamphlet, The Discovery of Witches, which was a, a big favorite of the witch hunters in Connecticut and Massachusetts, uh, he frames that like a dialogue, and the whole thing just kind of comes across as a bad knockoff of James's work. And beneath demonology's hard logic, there's a very palpable undercurrent of fear. That same primal, tribal fear that's fueled every persecution in history. It oozes through in James's offhanded misogyny, in his contempt, in his cruelty, and in his utter lack of curiosity. In his very first line, Epistemon says to Philomathes that he is willing to have his mind changed by their discourse. And in a book filled with witches, goblins, fairies, and monsters, that might be the most outlandish part. Thanks so much to Dr. Justin Sledge for lending me his considerable expertise in this topic. If you haven't checked out his companion video to this one, hop on over to the Esoterica channel and do so. I hope you all enjoyed this, frankly, demented little project. Till next time, I bid thee heartily farewell. <laughs>